Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the studio. Glad you could join me today. Uh, today we have a beautiful local scenery uh, subject to paint. Uh, we see egrets everywhere around here, so uh, it'll be lovely to make a nice painting of this one. Lots of good shadows to use and uh, lots of background to pop the bird out. So let's go over to the table and see what we can do today. So here's our subject. To make a white subject look white on watercolor paper, you must surround it with darker colors. And those darker colors could be midtones, light midtones, or darks. All of those variations of color will pop the white out. You don't necessarily have to have a really dark color behind white to make it show up as white. Okay, so um, it's interesting how that works in watercolor. The paper color is so powerful in watercolor that you don't necessarily have to have a really dark tone behind it. Okay, so things that we need today. Here's our subject. We'll put this to one side. We'll talk about the proportions of that in a moment. Five by seven, these skill building exercises we're doing. This is our source material, kind of nice. And you can change your background shape if you want to like this, or you can make it diagonal or as you wish. That's fine. And as always for watercolor, we do not need a very strong drawing or a very detailed drawing. We just need to know where the shadows are. We need to know what the shape of the subject is. And we need to know any specific areas, the shapes of the specific areas. But we really don't need a detailed drawing. So detailed drawing only makes your painting a lot tighter. And so try and be aware of that when you paint. Um, the background needs to go behind the birds, so it's a soft background. So we'll be doing a wet and wet today in that area to make that work. I made this one just a little bit more textured. So you can choose whether you want something a little closer up or something a little further away. Further away means soft edges. Closer up means slightly sharper edges in some places. And those slightly sharper edges were added in afterwards. So we can work on that a little bit, and that's your choice. Let's take a look at what we need to paint today. We need our normal number 10, number 8, and number 6 brush, and the flat brush today. And as well as that, we may need just a little bit of white because it's really hard to save these little white accents on the front of the legs here. And it's probably easier not even to bother and just use a little white paint in that, in that area. So everything else will be saved as white paper. And uh, the, the uh, log here will be saved too, so that won't be too much of a problem either. So hopefully you've got your drawing ready to go. And we'll take a look at the colors here before we start to, to think about the painting. So simple colors today. A lot of the colors that you know already are ultramarine blue from the basic palette and Prussian blue, the two blues, the darker, the cooler blue and the warmer blue. This is the warmer blue, leans towards purple. This is the cooler blue, leans towards green. Okay. So that's how we tell the difference between those two blues. Cadmium yellow and cadmium red for the beak. Need a little bit of that color. And also to make the greens. So we'll need both of those today. All right, a little bit of red, not too much. Okay, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, and burnt sienna. It's quite a simple palette today, but we can get a lot of color out of this simple palette. Uh, we're going to make our grays with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. So that gives us all of these nice tones here. And this particular mix of gray gives a blue gray or a, a warm gray, it doesn't really matter. And we're going to use a little of the yellow in the bird too to uh, bring it forward and pop it. Even though it's a white bird, white has a lot of color in it. It's amazing how much color you can put into a white painting and make it still make it feel white. So, okay, we're ready for that. Now, when you're drawing something like this, um, I gave you the drawing because it takes a little too long in the webinar for us to draw this as well. You need to be aware of proportions. So it's a good idea to look at your subject and see what proportions you can use. And I usually start with something I can go back to easily. And so that would be maybe the length of the head. Right? And that I mark that, or I hold that with my fingernail against my pencil and to the back of the head. And then I see how many other 
proportions like that I can see in this bird. Well, interestingly enough, it's just a little less across the bird on this one, but it's the same proportion from here to here. This proportion, this length, is the same length as the neck, the length of the neck going down to about here. And then again, another one of those proportions takes us down to here. And then the tail is about a quarter of that. So I'm always looking for the possibility of using proportions like this. The proportion of the legs, the back leg from the wood, is about the same length as this proportion. And the width across the bird, let's just check that, is just a little bit less than that. So it's it's the same as the beak to the back of the eye. And so when I'm drawing, I'm looking for that. I'm also looking for angles. And I'm using my pencil to estimate the angle. So I estimate the angle and I take my pencil and I draw it in that angle. And I'm always drawing on tracing paper so that I can make a clean drawing on the watercolor paper. You don't want to erase too much on the watercolor paper because it will disturb the surface and then your paint will look different in the areas that you've erased. So very, very important not to do that. Keep a nice, clean outline drawing on there. So these proportions are important and they help us to understand a little bit about how animals and people, and they're particularly important, proportions are particularly important in anything living. So animals, people, um, Landscapes, not so much, and street scenes, not so much, unless you put people in the street scenes, and then you need to worry about proportions. So anything living needs to have accurate proportions to make, make them look, or to make it look, whatever you're painting, uh, real. Okay, so we're going to start off by making a very large amount of wash with the two blues mixed together. Now, you could use just one blue. Looking at the subject here, it's a little bit more of the Prussian blue and a little bit less of the ultramarine blue. But you can use more of this if you prefer that blue, that's fine, no problem at all. So we're going to make a huge wash. And then we're going to put this wash uh, over the paper to wet the paper first. So we have to have the colors that we need to use down here ready to go so we can drop those into the wash. And those colors are greens and browns and warmish tones back there okay so let's see if we can get that ready to go so this is my thought process before i start to paint what i'm thinking about what i need to do before i start to paint so let's get a big big puddle of prussian blue prussian blue is pretty strong it's a sky color that we need so the sky color is going to be lighter than the tape let me just pull this over a little bit so you can see as we're we're testing this lighter than the tape okay much lighter than the tape and we need enough paint to cover this whole area so that's an awful lot of paint so make sure you make a big puddle best to make more than you need rather than less and if your paint dries on the palette you know you can reuse it it's not wasted you just leave it there and use it for the next painting so don't worry too much about that Okay, let's just check that on the side here. Is that lighter than the tape? Yes, it's lighter than the tape when I squint and when it dries, it's lighter than the tape. But I think I'd like it to be a little bit lighter still. And I'd like it not to be just one color because one color is just a little flat. It's just a touch lighter, but not a whole lot. A little bit more water in the mix. Balancing the colors, the amount of water is really important. Okay, that's that's getting there that's getting closer this one but before i go any further i'm going to add in a little ultramarine just to give it some more interest so it's going to be more prussian overall but it's got just a little ultramarine to give that blue a little bit more interest so let's try again okay that looks good now we have two choices. We can wet the paper or we can work with this color. I think we're going to work with this color because if we wet the paper up, um, it's going to be just a little bit more difficult for you to handle. So what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to wash this color over half of the paper. And then we're going to come back in and wet the paper again for these, for these colors at the bottom. So we're going to do it in two steps today. So we'll take this blue wash down to about 
the legs of the bird. And then we'll leave that area open for um, a second wash that we'll add in right away. And a few blooms in here will work really nicely, particularly in the background. So let's see if we can make that happen today. So test again before you start. Make sure your color's where you want it to go, uh, where you want it to be. And it doesn't have to be too dark. So I think maybe I'll have just even a little bit more water in there. And I'm going to use a number 10 brush because I want it to be really juicy. Yes, that should be about right, I think. Okay, now wet up the brush and pick up the paint. And we'll go back over here so you can see what's happening. There we go. And we'll go in just a little bit closer so you can see what we're doing. Okay. So it's a very easy shape to paint around. We could use Frisket and paint the whole background, um, but it's actually a good idea to get used to painting around a subject because we do that in an awful lot in watercolor. And this is a very easy shape to handle as you paint around. So I'm going to start about here and look at my color. And I'm seeing that to be just a little bit darker than I thought it was. And so I'm going to add just a little bit more water and adjust it. Just because we've made it, it doesn't mean we have to go with it. We can change it, okay, to make it the way we want. So don't be too put off by that idea of, oh dear, I've got to continue. No, you don't have to continue. You can change it. All right, here we go. And we'll take that way down. And doesn't matter if it goes further down. That's not a problem. There's a little bit of sky in here. And that sky actually should be just a bit darker. Because when you see a sky through a small space like that, it always looks a little darker. Okay, we'll go all the way around. I'm moving my, my um, painting around. You can see how easy it is to paint around this, this animal. It's not, it's, really, it's not a problem. I'm going to bring that down just a little bit more. And I'm working very quickly. Let's just pull that out. Because I don't want the sky to dry before I've finished. So I'm working really quickly here, a little bit more of a space there. And let's just even it out a little bit. If you want a few clouds in the sky, you can lift those out too along the way. That would be another possibility. That's your choice. And we'll just come down here. Now we can run this right over the legs because the legs are going to be darker overall. So that makes it a whole lot easier. And maybe we will just go down to the bottom since we, we're almost there. It's not going to be that difficult to do. There we go. Okay. Now, if you do want to pull out a few clouds, and that little darker area is going to give us the opportunity to wet this up again and make the second wash on there. Just tighten up the edges a little bit where you've missed little areas. Make sure you're tight up against the edge of the bird all the way around. Okay, if you do want to lift out clouds in this one, the best way to do it would be with a damp tissue, something that, oh, Kleenex, something that you've put in your water and squeezed out like this, so it's just a little damp. Because we don't want a sharp edge in the background here, we want just soft edges. So you can just touch that very gently onto the paper, and you can make a few little clouds in there if you would like to. It's just a slight addition that makes it a little bit different. There we go. Just a tiny amount, not too much. Okay, I'm going to stop with that now. So this is your first step. So go ahead and do that. And then we're going to be working the background on top of this. I'm wiping the edges of the tape so that it doesn't bleed back into the sky and cause a bloom. And we're going to be wetting it up again at the bottom in some places. So we might have just a little touch of... Let me just touch that in one second more. Let me lift that up just a little bit. Okay, now I've got a darkened layer here. Can you see that above the beak? 
And I'm not too thrilled about that. So what I'm going to do is leave it and come back and fix it later. And I'll show you how to do that. It's kind of a little bloom because things are just a drying just a little fast. And I have a similar thing here, which doesn't matter. But above the beak, it might not work so well. So that's a good fix it that we'll do at the end. So this is about the amount of paint that you want, about the tone. Not too much darker than this. Colors we used were Prussian blue and ultramarine, or if you like ultramarine, just ultramarine, or if you like Prussian, just Prussian. All of those would work. Use a number 10 brush and work quickly. And do test your color on the side to make sure it's not going to be too dark or too light should be lighter than the tape. The advantage of painting around rather than using frisket is that you don't get such a sharp edge. And frisket always looks as though um, it's very, very hard edged when you've used it. And the liquid latex is always a problem because it gives an edge that's really, really sharp. And we don't like that, the way that looks so much in watercolor. Okay, a lot of you are getting there, so great. So we're ready to move on to the next stage. And I'm going to put this to one side because we need to mix up some colors before we go any further. We need to mix up some colors for the uh, background area here. So let's go back to the palette, take a look at our subject, and see what sort of colors we need here. In the background here, I see greens, and I see browns, and I see dark greens, something that looks a sort of little reddish color, purplish color up there. So we can make a, a wide variety of those colors. And what we're going to do is we're going to put them on the paper next to each other, and then soften the edges so they bleed out just a little bit. So we get nice soft edges like this. Okay. Another way to do that would be to drop them into that first wash that we did on the paper already. But in such a big wash, it's difficult to get everything the right um, with the right amount of water uh, to be able to do that. One way to do it, if you're going to enlarge this painting, is to use 300 pound paper. This is 140 pound, the weight that we're using right now. When you use 300 pound paper, the paper stays wet much longer and gives you the opportunity to deal with subjects like this. That technique of putting the paint on while the first wash is still wet. Okay, so lots of different possibilities and ways to deal with all of these painting um, techniques. One size does not fit all. It depends on the subject. Okay, so we want a fairly dark tone down here. Not quite as dark as you see it on the screen, but <clears throat> or as I see it on the screen, but at least a middle tone. Darker than the tape. Can you see that? Obviously darker than the tape. And so this time we're not going to use too much water in the mix. We're going to have some burnt sienna ready to go all by itself with not too much water in it. Okay, that's pretty strong. And we'll need a fair amount of this. It's quite a big space that we're covering here. So let's have some more, a little bit more water in the mix. So when you have strong paint, you need to make sure it's not sticky. It still needs to flow like this. Uh, it shouldn't be sticky. You probably saw initially when I put my brush in, it was sticking, sticking to the, um, to the palette. And when it's sticky, it doesn't work. You want just a little bit of flow. This is watercolor. So you want water in your paint to make it flow. Let's take a look at that color. That's darker than the tape. Good. So that's a good start. And now we're going to think about the, the greens that we've got in here. And they're fairly warm greens, dark warm greens. So for warm greens, we always start with a warm yellow. Let me just take that out. I'm going to start in there. And the warmer yellow of the two is cadmium. And that's why we're using cadmium today. Okay, again, this is now a little sticky, okay, just a little bit too sticky when I have that much paint and not enough water. So I'm going to pull it out and give it a little more flow. 
This is the cadmium yellow. Now, we know that when we mix uh, blue and yellow together, we get green. We're going to get different greens depending on which blue we mix with this. If we mix uh, Prussian with this, we're going to get a nice muted green. And if we mix uh, ultramarine with this, we're going to get a more muted green, a green that's a little more muted. This is bright. If you don't want it to be so bright on the paper, you drop in a little bit of burnt sienna. Or even before you start painting, you drop in a little burnt sienna. Depends on how you'd like your greens to look today. They're going to have a mixture of warm tones anyway. So that might be a good base color to use and then drop other colors in. Let's see if we can find another base color that we can mix as well. And we can use the sky color because we have that opportunity. Um, since I have the ultramarine here already, I'm just going to mix that up and then add the yellow in to um, make a different green. This will be a much more muted green because these two colors are further apart on the color wheel. So blue and yellow make green, but not necessarily the same green, okay? Depending on the colors that you use. So here's a more muted version, slightly lighter, more muted, like an olivey green. Okay, so we can use all of those. If this one appears to be too bright to you, you calm it down by adding just a little bit of burnt sienna. And the reason I'm saying that is because it appears to be a little too bright to me. So I'm going to add just a little burnt sienna into the mix to calm it down and make it less bright. See how that changes the color just a touch and makes it less intense. Okay, so those are the colors we need. Whether we have enough of them or not is going to be an issue. I think perhaps we need to have just a little bit more of each of those. And the reason I'm going again is because it's really good practice for you to learn how to mix colors. Ooh, we got a little paint on the, on the paper there. Um, really good practice for you to keep mixing colors so that you know you're very familiar with this color mixing. Okay, just a little bit more of that. And a little more yellow in there. You need to, to know that you can make this particular color anytime you like. And a touch of burnt sienna in that one. And we'll see if that works. Pretty much identical. So we can make that same color anytime you want to. All right, so that, that should work. And now we'll have a little bit more of this one, just to make sure. And we'll make it just a tiny touch darker. That should work. Just a touch more yellow in there. And a touch more water in there. There we go. That should do it for that one. Check that again. That's a little thin. We'll have just a bit more color in it. Okay. And to make it more um, olive, then you use a little more yellow. So if you prefer that more olive tone, you just put a little bit more yellow into it. Okay, so that's good. So we've got browns, we've got greens, we've got all of those colors. So now we're going to think about the pa pattern that we want back here. I did a just a diagonal line here with a very loose top on this one. Um, you don't need to cover the whole bird, uh, but at least half of it up to about here. It's a good idea to have a good dark. And I just made it just a little bit more... Um, solid at the back there. So the pattern that you decide can be up to you. And you can start right away by deciding where that's going to go by putting just a little burnt sienna. I'm going to keep those colors here so you can see how I'm mixing them on the paper. A little bit of burnt sienna will give you the idea of the pattern that you'd like to use back here. So you could have just a touch of goodie going through there. Now immediately I'm going to soften the edges of that because I don't want that to be too sharp. So that's going to be one little area. This is the top edge of the, um, of the pattern that I'm going to use. Let's use something like this where we have a little negative space as well. So we'll pull that down and make this just a little bit more of a negative space in here, just so it has a bit more interest as opposed to just straight. And we'll just soften those edges back into paper. So that gives us the outline of where we want to go, just at the beginning there, just tells us where we want to go with our mess of background. 
So now we can start adding in all of the darker colors down here. We can put a little of the green. Yikes! I can hear you saying it. A little of the green, a little of this, a little of the burnt sienna, and we're building up texture, and we're building up color, warms and cools, and we're going to paint around this, okay? And if you can paint around the legs, do, but if you can't, it's not such a big deal because they'll be darker anyway. Just a little bit more warm in there, a bit more warm in here, and this looks like a big mess right now, but it's all going to come together. So what you're going to do is you're going to just push it up into those areas. And you can see how that's beginning to look like foliage in there. I'm just going to keep dropping in different colors along the way. It'll be warmer if you use more burnt sienna. It'll be cooler if you use more blue. Turn it upside down. Put just a little bit in here. What you don't want to do is go a long way without adding in another color. Okay, you want a nice variety of warm and cool colors in here. So if you do green, you drop in a little bit of brown. And if you do this green, then you drop in a little bit of the other green. If you can paint around the legs, do. But if you can't, don't worry about it. It won't hurt. Okay, we'll go in here with this one. It's not such a big deal. A little bit of brown in there. And we'll finish that off on the back here. There we go. And this is all really good practice for painting around objects in watercolor. Okay, so now we're getting that idea of mixed foliage back there. A little bit more green up here in with the brown. A little bit more brown in here in with the green and go nice and tight up against the bird again. And we'll, we can use a little bit of a white paint to add that extra feather that we see in there later on. Now, all the while it stays soft, it will go further back in the background. And I'm just going to take it right up to that edge that we decided we were going to use for finishing. And if we keep it nice and soft like this, it's going to disappear into the background. And it will all dry lighter. You know that. So it looks really dark right now, but it's not going to dry that way at all. And as I go up into this top area, I'm just going to finish it off in a, a sort of foliage type way, just loosely like we did to begin with. Drop in just a little burnt sienna again along the edges. And a little over here too. Right up close to the to the bird. Oh, I lost my little negative space there. Let's pull that back a little bit. So you can fix, you can change, right? You can see how things don't have to be set in stone. These little edgy things are kind of nice the way they pop out there. So I'm going to have a few of those. This one can have a little bit more of an edgy feel. And that one too. And that gives us kind of what we're looking for. I'm just going to soften off those edges just a wee bit. Now this one's going to be pretty flat. If later on you decide that you'd like this to come forward just a bit, um, then we can add in another layer when it's dry to give some more texture. Okay. So I'm going to add just a bit more brown in there and add some of that dark green down in this corner and a little bit more down in that corner too. And bring that down just a little bit closer on the edges. Okay, so we're pretty much there for this one. Just a little bit more green up here to pop that nice white belly out of it. dark and in there too okay so that's our idea for the background go ahead and make that happen and all the while it's still wet you can keep adding in paint and if you get blooms in there that's great because it'll look more like foliage that will be fine
Trying to soften the edge here just a little bit next to the trunk because that's the light side of the trunk and we want that to flow in just a little bit. Okay, we are good to go on that. You want it to look way far back, you're going to soften these edges a little more. Okay, I'm going to leave it now because it's drying, but uh, we can always soften this later if we, if we want to. And we'll just wipe the edge. Fill in the little whites that I missed. Now all of that's going to dry much lighter than it looks. So that was why we had to start with a very dark tone. Okay, and that gives us a nice impression of foliage back there. Okay, let it do what watercolor does best, and that's just paint itself and soften down and do mix together and do things that you couldn't possibly do if you tried. When you put colors together like this, they have a wonderful way of mixing together themselves and making everything look more interesting. So anytime you want to make your color work better, you think in terms of putting, mixing your colors on the paper rather than in the palette. And that way the color is much more random, much more interesting. All right, now what we did today was much easier than using a big wet in wet wash, okay? Much more um, easy to control. The wet in wet wash kind of runs away with you and always dries much, much lighter and you usually have to do a couple of layers. And so this one we probably won't have to touch too much. Now it's going to take a while to dry down. So while that's drying down, we're going to go back into our um, palette and see if we can make some of these nice grays to enhance the bird. These nice blue grays here and the lighter grays here. And we'll see how those will work. So let's move over and Good idea to get out of that background as soon as you've got your colors in. Don't mess with it too much. It's not going to do what you exactly want it to do. It'll do what watercolor does because watercolor has a life of its own. And if you want your paintings to look more like watercolors, you're going to let the watercolor do what it does more than trying to force it into something that perhaps isn't necessary. Okay, so just let it be. And I know you have a tendency of you, I, everybody has a tendency to jump in there and say, oh, I don't like this. I've got to fix it. As the painting is drying like this, that's the very worst thing that you can do. You absolutely don't want to try and fix anything. At the end of the painting, you can go in and you can fix a lot of things. And I'll show you some fixes. I'll show you the little fix for the, for the area that I've got here above and any other fixes that you might need in this painting. So don't, don't go there. All right, you'll have to sit on your hands to stop doing it, but don't go there because it's not a good idea to work on it while it's drying. It just makes your painting overworked and heavy, and that's not the way we want watercolors to look. Okay, all right, so let's take a look now. We're going to go in a little bit more closely to the palette here and find a gray, and the gray that we use is a mixture of blue and brown. And the reason it makes gray is because these two colors are opposite each other on the color wheel. I'm just taking the green off that uh, before I use it. Uh, these two colors are opposite each other on the color wheel. And this is ultramarine blue we're using now, which is the warmer of the two. Okay, ultramarine blue on my palette is here, Prussian is next to it. Okay, so ultramarine blue. So that's this blue, this one here, this one here, that's just a little warmer. 
ultramarine blue and a touch of burnt sienna, which in my palette's over here. Okay. So when I mix those two together, I get a gray. Now, if I use equal amounts or an equal amount to balance each color, they're not actually equal amounts of each color, I'm going to get a gray that is neutral like this, it's kind of in the middle, right? In the middle, grays don't appeal to me personally as much as grays that lean just a little cooler. Let's try a little bit more blue. That feels like it has a little bit more color life. And even if I add a little more blue, it will feel better. And that's a blue-gray, more of a blue-gray. If I add just a little more burnt sienna along the way, I can take that into a warmer gray, more of a brownish gray. So with these two colors, we have a tremendous range of opportunities. Because we can make grays, we can also make browns, and we can also make black with these two colors, just by varying the amount of color and the amount of water. So make a gray that you like. I rather like the idea of the blue that's on the back here, and so I'm making my grays just a little bit bluer to capture that idea of blue. So I'm going to add just a bit more of the blue in here. Just a touch more burnt sienna to make sure I have enough color and take a look at that and see how that looks. And the blue-gray should be about the same tone as the tape at this point because it, this is a light middle tone and that's kind of what we're looking at at the back here. This is a light tone. This is a light middle tone. This is a dark tone. And so we have to kind of compare the tones as we're painting. And so there's a little shadow here that's a touch lighter, but the shadow on the back of the bird is, is a, good, a good middle tone, a light to middle tone. So we'll in that ballpark. But we won't use the same amount of, of paint in the lighter shadows. We'll use more water in the mix to make them lighter. Okay? So make a blue-gray that is about the same tone as the tape. And then we'll be ready to move on here. I'm going to leave that palette showing so that you can see. I'll go in just a touch closer. You can see what we're doing here. And then we'll move over so you can see the paint. There we go. All right. So you can see how this is drying lighter and softer and ends up as a background color because of that. I have a few blooms in here which are working pretty nicely where the paint was wetter on my brush than it was on the paper and that's what causes those blooms. So now you know how to avoid them. Okay, as soon as you've got your blue-gray ready, we're going to make sure that the background behind the bird is dry. You can touch it without the paint wetting up. Right, because we don't want to paint into the background at all. And we're painting on the back of the bird, so I think I'll just turn it sideways and make it easier. What we're painting is this shadow here. Now some shadows are going to have sharp edges and some are going to have soft edges. So this shadow has a sharp edge down here, then it begins to get softer as it comes through here. That front edge is soft. Okay. The way that we make that front edge soft is by washing the brush, putting it on the sponge, and just running it along the edge of the paint. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can have this color. It's just about dark enough. Coming on the back of the bird, we'll follow the pattern of the, of the bird that we see there. It's coming down the back here. When I look at it, I need to make sure it's dark enough on the paper. The, technically, it's darker in the picture, but uh, we know that photographs lie a little bit about how dark things are. And so we're OK, leaving leave a little bit of light on the edge there, a little bit of light here. The shape of the shadow comes around here and takes up pretty much the whole back of that bird. And then those two edges there are a little softer. So make that happen by rinsing the brush, 
and just softening off that edge just a little bit with the brush. Whoops, don't let it drip. Okay, soften off that edge just a little bit. Okay, your turn. The tape helps us to understand how light and how dark our colours are. It's really, really valuable at the beginning of the painting to understand how light and how dark things are. Just soften that edge a touch more. And a little extra feather we'll put on with the white paint afterwards. We don't need to save that. It's just fine. Okay. Once you've got that in, the next thing is to put the shadow behind the leg here under the wing. And it's actually a cast shadow in here that's being cast by the leg and it kind of catches the wing feathers a little bit and comes down to about there. You can have just a little shadow, a little line shadow underneath the back part of the wing back there. This one needs to have just a softer edge, a slightly softer edge. It's kind of part of that first shadow. There's a cast shadow from the neck that's being cast onto the back of the body here. So I'm just going to put that in and that connects up the neck and the body when we put the rest of the shadows in. Might have gone just a little bit too far back on that one. There's a little shadow in the neck down here at the bottom where the neck meets the wing and it kind of goes up a little bit there too. So this little whole area is shadowed and that should have a soft edge. The top of that shadow should have a soft edge. Up under the chin, there's a little shadow that comes back here. It's actually part of the, the beak, but we'll put that little shadow in. And there's a little shadow on the back of the neck here too. Just a touch. It comes around. And connects with that neck shadow that we put in before. Now I'm just adding a touch more water to the shadow mix because the rest of the shadows are a little bit lighter. And they're here, this one here, just a little lighter. There's a touch of a shadow in the neck here. And that should have a slightly softer edge. Soften that off. This one does not. There's a shadow in the back of the neck on this side. And again, that has a softer edge as it comes out. All of these shadows give us the dimension of the bird, and they're really very important. There's a little more shadow on the stomach down here. Put that in. And then we have just a few on the, on the um, wings. So we have a slightly darker shadow. We don't have quite so much of that up. Might need to darken that a little bit there. Just a little touch of a shadow there. This one I'm just going to break up a little bit. That's quite that solid. And then the lighter shadows on the wing I'm going to put in and possibly add to later. So 
So they come in the direction of the feathers like this, around and over, and they're very light, and there's just a few of them. Don't cover up all of the white, be careful. Just indicate that shape of the wing, just a little bit there. And that one's just a wee bit too long, so I'll just lift that. If you make a mistake, you can just wet it up and blot it with the tissue to change anything that you've done. These are most of the colors that we use on this palette, except for Prussian blue, um, are liftable. And so you can always go back to the white paper by just wetting like this and blotting if you need to. Okay, so it was looking fairly dimensional right now. I think we need just a touch more of that light, light shadow here going up into the neck just a little bit to give it a touch more dimension. Okay, amazing what shadows will do. They're very subtle, but they're very important. Um, there's just one more little space, I think, here that we need a, a shadow in. And that's the belly area here, and I didn't make that shadow quite dark enough. It needs to be just a little darker down there. And the one up here just a touch darker. And in here we'll just accent that shadow a little bit and make it a touch darker. And now on this shadow, I'm going to soften the edge just a little bit more. Now, I didn't do this while it was wet, so I just have to work it a little bit with my brush to make that happen. Just soften it a little bit because it's making the wrong shape on the bird because it has a sharp edge. And that's a good thing to know that that's what's happening. The difference is now that that area rolls around. And before, it was a sharp, sharp edge, and that didn't work quite as well. So let me just put a little bit more turn there. <clears throat> and I think we're good to go on those shadows. While we've got this gray on our um, palette, we can add just a tiny bit of burnt sienna to it, make it really light. And this will be the undercoat for the wood. Just pull it down with a few brush strokes like that. Leave some white showing. It's called dry brush. And I'm still using my number eight brush. Okay, number 10 to begin with, number eight for this. And if we need to add any more shadows, we can put them in later. We, we will need to put in some warm tones now. And slightly warmer tones in some places to bring the bird forward. When you add a warm tone, it brings the animal forward. Warm tones advance and cooler tones recede. So areas that we might want to add warm tones would be on the wing here, possibly this area here. We want it to come forward a bit. Maybe we'd like the head to come forward just a little bit. So let's see if we can make a, a warm tone on the palette that might make that work. I would normally just jump in and use raw sienna, so that's one possibility, but it's a good idea to know how to make other warm tones. So I'm going to use cadmium red and cadmium yellow together. More yellow than red, okay, so it's more of a gold tone. So let's take a look at that on the paper. That's a good color, but it's way too dark. And so I need to add a lot of water to that because this gold tone needs to be almost not there. Even that's just a bit too dark. So I have to add even more water to that to make it really pale. Now we're talking. Now we're getting to the point where it's about the right tone. It's hardly visible. Can you see right there? It's just about visible on the paper. That's what we need, is a light gold tone that's just about visible on the paper. And if it's too strong, you just put your brush on the sponge. Okay? If you find that you've made it too strong, when you put it on the paper, you just bring it over and 
put your brush on the sponge to take some of the paint off and that helps. So let's check again. Okay, so this nice little gold tone we're going to add in here, just a touch, just a tiny touch. And again, if it's too dark or if you don't like it, just blot it. That looks okay, I'm going to go with that. And a little bit in here, just a couple of touches in the wing. Just a little tiny touch on the head here. Okay, where else would we like it to come forward? Maybe the neck could come forward just a little bit. And a touch more here. And that's about it. I don't need to have too many more warm tones. That should be just about right. Maybe just a touch there to bring that shoulder forward just a little bit. And that has the ability now to, um, to give us more interest in the color, but also to pop that um, area and pull it forward visually. Okay, all right. Now we can go back to those same colors. Let me let you do that first, and then we're going to start to paint the, the head of the heron. By now your background should be dry enough to, to be able to do that. And we may need to restate just a few of those shadows if once we've finished painting. We'll see how that goes. Okay, the very slightest, lightest touch of areas that you want to pop forward. Okay, and the color was hardly visible on the page right here. It's just a tiny, tiny accent of very light color. Okay, all right, now we're going to mix a color for the beak, and that's orange, but it's orange, it's light, it's a yellow orange, right? more than anything, and it also has yellow in the beak too, in the top and the bottom, and so we're looking for a yellow orange, which means we use more yellow and less red, okay, so a little bit more yellow in the mix there, and we'll test that on the paper again to see if it's correct. That's okay, but it's not quite dark enough for the beak. So I'm going to add a tiny touch more red to it. Make it fairly strong. Let's check that and see if that feels better. That feels better for the bottom part of the beak, and that feels better for the top part of the beak. So we can use a little bit of both. I'll put a little bit more yellow in this side so we can have both. Okay. And then we need just a little bit of pure yellow too. So we can add that to the top and the bottom. So three colors there, orange, more of a yellow orange and yellow. Ooh, cadmium red and cadmium yellow we're using for those colors. There we go. Okay, it's a little bit closer in so we can see what we're doing. Looking at our subject, we're looking for a darker orange at the base of the beak and lighter at the top and then yellow up to the eye and yellow just underneath in this area underneath here. Okay, so let's start with that darker orange underneath the beak. Now I'm using a number eight, but if your number eight is not pointed, you might want to use a number six brush for this because it's just a little bit more. Maybe I'll move to a six so you can see. It's just a little bit more um, detail and uh, a little easier to paint smaller areas with a slightly smaller brush. Okay, so we're looking for this and watch your background. If it's not completely dry, um, you can layer a tissue over it and you can paint with that. Shouldn't, shouldn't hurt the background. Okay, a little bit of a darker tone underneath the beak, coming up to about here. And then the lighter yellow, go, yellow orange goes on top. And it stops at about here, and then it becomes pure yellow. We'll put a little bit more dark tone under here, just so I can get that shape. 
And then this becomes yellow, bright yellow, under here. And the top becomes yellow as it goes into the eye. And paint the yellow right over the eye, because the eye is yellow, and we'll paint that in afterwards. We'll touch up these little edges and connect everything after this is dry. I'm thinking that it could be just a little bit more red underneath. So I'm going to make it just a bit stronger. And I'm talking to you, and when I say I'm doing this, it's because I'm suggesting what you could do in your painting if you find that these things are happening. So when I say I'm doing this, I'm hoping that you will um, think I'm talking to you too, because that's what's intended. There we go. A nice strong yellow gold color there. And the nice thing about cadmium is that it actually does sit on top of other colors. And so um, you can go right over the top here and it will actually cover the sky color because it's a slightly more opaque paint and so it's useful for that. And while I'm doing this, before it has a chance to dry, I'm just going to add in a little touch of the gray, the shadow color really light shadow color right under here and that connects everything together and we'll put the line between the top of the beak and the bottom of the beak we'll add in later we just need that little dark touch in there right now and the little dark touch under the eye of shadow color Now we're going to give that chance to dry down. We're going to move down to the legs. Back to the palette again. And now we need a black for the legs. And they are pretty black. And so we can use a pure black here. It can be a bluish black or a brownish black. It doesn't matter. And we're going to paint the legs solid and then try, uh, um, and then we'll add in some of the whites at the end. So the black color is made just like the gray color, just more paint and less water. So I'm going to start with ultramarine blue over here, and I'm still using my number six brush because it's a small area, and add in burnt sienna. Now you'll notice I'm using very little water here. To make dark colors, you do not use a lot of water and you can make them instantly. Now, if your paints are not moist, like mine, you'll have a really hard time making dark colors. You'll be scrubbing at the paints. And so all day long, I am spraying my paints with water like this as I'm using them. And I keep them so that the surface of the paint feels like it just came out of the tube. And that way, I can mix up my colors very quickly and very easily. And that's one of the keys to making dark colors. So we can make a black instantly if our colors are nice and wet. Okay, it's a nice good middle of the road black. If you add a little more brown to it, it'll be um, a warm black. And if you add a little more blue to it, it'll be a cool black. And the colors I used were ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. Same colors for grays, browns, and black. And now, even though I see the front of this leg being a little bit lighter, I'm going to paint the whole leg dark and add the light in later. Okay, so I'm going to start with the idea of the one further away and then I won't put my hand in it when I'm, when I'm painting. Let's just come back to the, the painting here so you can see it a bit more clearly. There we go. Now these legs are pretty straight and they end up uh, disappearing up into the white here. So we'll just start off like that. And there's a, a knee, okay, here that we have to um, allow for. And 
I'll take that line straight down. A little bit too much paint on my brush, so that's where the sponge comes in. Okay, down here, and down this way, all the way down to the foot. And I did manage to leave a little white there. It was quite by accident, but we might use that, or we might just add in a little white on top afterwards. Make sure you make the legs thick enough. They're, they're thin, but they're not that thin, okay? And as they dry down, we can, um, and they will look thinner when we put the white on too. If you end up making them too wide, you can take your tissue like this, and you can just lay it across the edge, and you can just lift up some of that color. Take your tissue and lay it across the edge. And if you find that you'd like to have, that you've left just a bit too much space for the foliage, that can be added in afterwards too. Okay, so just make sure that's not too, too thick there. That bottom part seems just a little thick to me. There we go. So we can adjust that later. And this one, same idea. Just going to paint it in. This one feels like it has a slightly better proportion. It has a little um, elbow there. It comes down that way. And again, any areas that are not quite right, you can fill in with um, with the background color later. So don't worry too much about that. There we go. Okay, now the feet are pretty much horizontal, and we'll just do a little bit of the foot as it goes across the top here, and we'll finish them off after we've finished the wood. So they're going that way, and there's another leg coming that way. So we won't do the nails yet, we'll just do the, the little part that sits on the top of the wood. They thicken out just a little bit as they come to to the ankle there. And I've got maybe that one back one is still just a little bit too wide. So we'll just take that back a wee bit. There we go. Let's see how to do that. And we can adjust them yet. We're not done yet. Okay, I'm going to go back to my number eight brush when I've done that. And we'll work on the on the wood just a bit. So back to the palette. Now we're going to turn that black into dark brown for the wood. And so we're going to add more burnt sienna to it, or at least part of it. You can save some if you like, but we don't need that anymore. Add burnt sienna, and now we have brown. Okay, and that's quite a good brown color for the wood. Just test it here. It should be darker than the tape. And we're going to use that brown tone and a little bit of the blue-gray in here just to give some suggestions of interest to the wood. Can you see what I just did there? A little bit of vertical tones. Okay, and as I come round, I'm going to lighten it just a bit, like this. And then I'm going to take a little bit of my shadow color that we used on the bird, and just run that in between. A little bit of light on the left-hand side. Make sure the right-hand side is darker. And if you need more light, if you've lost your light on the right-hand side, here's where the flat brush comes in. You can lift out a little more light there, all the way through. Okay, make it just a bit lighter. Flat brush is really good for lifting. You put it in the water, you put it on the sponge like this, just flatten it down, and then you can use it for lifting. 
So that's pretty good, uh, but we need it to be darker on the dark side. And so I'll add just a touch more of the ultramarine into that. And we'll make this area here just a little darker. Not right to the edge, but almost. Pull it around. And now we're getting a feeling of something that's a bit more dimensional. And it can be warmer or cooler depending on how much brown you put in the mix. Okay, and we have a suggestion. This is a soft edge here. We have a suggestion of dimension because we're using light and dark. And because we have a soft edge here, it wants to go around. And so that's why we use these soft edges. So let's put another little slightly darker tone here and soften that edge. And then we get more of that. So this should run into a darker tone. And this should be just a touch lighter at the back here than it is here because it's a cylinder. And that's the way the light affects cylinders. And that little white on the top is, is the light catching. And you can leave that if you want to. We will put a little shadow in there um, that we see those little shadows when this is dry. So just a little of that white, light and dark will give us the wood. It's very easy to paint wood, actually. Not easier than you think. All right. And while that's drying down, then we're going to go back and work on the eye and finish off the head <coughs> and add in any more shadows that we might need in the bird. It's coming along pretty nicely. We will need a tiny touch of black. So if you used all of your black, then just mix it up again, just a very small amount for the center of the eye and for yeah, pretty much for the eye. There's a little grey around the eye, but we can use the shadow for that. Such a tiny bird, we don't need too much detail. So there isn't highlight in this eye. Um, and we're just going to dot it in with the tip of the brush here. It's just a round, a tiny black area here. Hard to see on the screen because it's just a little too pixelated when I go in close. Um, but next to that, we're going to put a little bit of a dark gray. You can just take your black and add a touch of water to it. Just going to darken this little area here. And just around the back of the eye, if you can do it, and the front too if you like, you can just outline it very slightly with with grey. And then this little touch here will be darker. And there is just a little shadow, grey shadow, under the head here that comes around. And we can soften that down just a bit. On a tiny bird like this, sometimes I use pencil for these details um, because it's easier. But if you want, if you want to use a pencil line, you can through the beak. Or if you want to paint that line through the beak, it's a brown line. And the brown is just the same as black. It's just you use more brown, more burnt sienna, and less blue. Just make sure you've got yellow in here too. Okay, and that's about all the detail we need in that area. Okay, that makes them come alive, doesn't it? Okay, let's see if we can finish off the legs now. Just before we do that, if this is still 
uh, if this is dry enough, just put in a few little lines in here in brown or black, just a suggestion of sharper edges in a few places. Looks like my legs aren't quite dry enough yet, so let's put the shadows on the... The shadows are a brownish grey. The shadows on the uh, wood, the cast shadows, and that's going to be lighter than black and darker than the grey that we used before. So it's a, a grey tone, and that shadow is going to come across here. It's a cast shadow. Come across there, and there's a little one coming over here. Okay, just a couple of little shadows there. It can be bluish or brownish, it doesn't really matter. That one looks better. And then we'll finish those feet off with a little bit more of a black tone. And we will put some white on the edge of these toenails because it's kind of what we see little bit there and this little toenail comes down here and we see just a little bit more of a shape on that one just a few edges there let's go in a bit more closely so you can see what I did okay so while we're looking closely at that we're going to finish off the this needs just a touch more dark in it, but that we can do later. We're going to finish off the legs with a little bit of white paint. And keep the white paint in the tube. Don't put it in your palette because it dries up and drops off, and so it's wasteful to do that. So you put it in the palette like this, and just a little bit, and it's fairly thick and sticky, so you want to add just enough water to make it flow. Okay, just a touch more. So it's more like heavy cream, that sort of consistency. And we'll just put the lid back on that. And now we're going to use a little bit of that, not too much, just a little on the front edge of the... I'm just going to use my sponge and blot it up so I don't put too much on. Okay, And we're going to run it down the front edge. Now it's going to look awfully white when I do this. Um, but it dries darker. You need to know that about white paint. It dries darker. So let's just put some in here. Okay, on the front of the leg and a little bit down here on the front of the leg. And it looks really white. A little bit on the nails. Just a tiny touch. It's just an accent. It's, use it for accents in watercolor. And that one really doesn't have, but we can put a little bit on there. And up here, it's it's a little whiter. The leg is a little whiter overall. And here, it's just a little whiter overall, too. So we can add just a touch more of that white up there. And on the knee, there's just a little bit more white in that one. And just a little less as we come down here. I'm hardly touching the paper with this. And I really see, apart from the, these areas, I really don't see too much white, but I'm going to put just a little bit on the top here and on there so you can just see how that works. Now, that will dry down darker. And you might find, like I do, that you've got some areas of green that didn't quite meet over there. And so I'm going to go back now with my green tones that I had originally that are still on the palette and just add in a little bit of the green back here just to tighten those edges up on both sides. And you can cut the black back a little bit with that too if you want to. On this side, same thing in here, just need a little bit more green to tighten that up. And 
we can soften this down, this white, if you need to, and it will get lighter, darker as it dries. It won't be quite so bright as it dries. Okay. Now we're going to do one more thing before, after you've done that, we're going to do one more thing before we finish off the edges of the bird. We need to make sure everything in the bird is dry before we do this. Okay, it's looking pretty nice right now, but we don't really want these pencil lines in here. And so we're going to take those out. And we will be adding just a little bit more shadow to the bird. I'm not quite done with that yet. Let's just take that pencil line out. Make sure everything is dry before you try to do this. And stay away from the legs because you just worked on those. Let's just make sure that we take out that pencil line so that it lightens up everything. And then we can add a few more shadows into the wings. Just a few touches of shadow color in that. Now, it's highly unlikely that you got your shadow color absolutely correct in the first um, layer. More likely than not that it needs just a little twitch, twist, twist, just a little touch of other colors. So let's just go in here and we'll darken this just a wee bit. And we'll darken this shadow just a tiny touch because it always dries lighter than you think. I'm not, I'm not painting over the whole shadow again. I'm just painting in the center of it to make it just a wee bit darker. That one seems to be okay. This one here just uses a little bit darker. This one here just a touch darker. Yeah, this one seems to be okay and this seems to be okay. But I think under the head we could have a slightly darker shadow there. Coming around the neck. And on the back of the head here, that shadow could be just a touch darker. And as it comes into here, just a little bit darker. And at the back of the neck here, just a touch, touch darker. So I'm just accentuating the shadows a little bit. And this wing looks a little bit flat. And so to make it more dimensional, I'm going to follow that shape of the back of the wing through here, because effectively this is another shadow. And this is a shadow that we didn't put in in the first place. And I'm going to take that shadow in like that and immediately pull it down into the wing so it has a softer edge. These are the very light shadow colors that we use. I'm just going to darken a couple of the areas here at the top where I just put that shadow in. Pull them down just a wee bit. So we have a nice feel for, for that shadow shape. Okay. Shadow can be just a bit darker on this edge too if you want it to. Just a little touch. And just push it up into the wing. Every time you add a tiny little shadow, it gives a bit more dimension to the bird. Okay, it's just tiny touches at this stage of the painting. Don't overdo it. And now we're going to take some more of that white paint and we're going to add in that feather that we see at the end here. And it kind of comes from here and kind of comes out. And this is what white paint is really useful for. It's not useful for painting whites, but it's useful for adding little touches and finishing off little areas like this. So if you found that you got a little bit of the sky color on the edge of your bird, this is what you can use the white paint for, is just to touch that up, tighten it up a little bit. Okay. 
and we don't really need much back here. We could have just a little feather, a little light feather in that shadow to give it more interest. And if you want to change the shape of this, the back of this, and make it just a bit more rounded, we could do that with the white too. This is watercolour paint, so it comes off just like watercolour paint does. And so you can go back and forth. It's actually called gouache. It's an opaque watercolour. I'm just going to change the shape with the background very slightly of this area here. Touch in a little bit of background colour. And by doing that, I can make it seamless, correct it seamlessly. Okay, I think we're pretty much close to being finished on our little bird here. Looking pretty good. And I don't think you need to do too many other things except maybe some corrections. So if your background isn't quite dark enough and you want to put another layer on it, then the way to do that now is just to add a little of the paint now that it's dry a little of the paint over the top in brush strokes like this, okay? And you can soften them down if you want to. And that will give you a little bit of texture and make it a bit darker. Okay, I'm not going to change this one because I think it works pretty nicely. I'm not going to make that uh, decision, but I will tighten up the front edge of the log here just a bit with the background and the back edge of the log just a little bit. And make that colour run out. Don't outline. Let the colour run out from the area. So where I added this green, I need to make it run out into the rest of that colour. Otherwise it looks like an outline and that's not so attractive. Okay, so you get just a few little edgy goodies in there and it's just enough to give some texture but not too much. So I'll let this run out just a little bit more too. You notice how the white has, has calmed down. If it's still too white, take your black and just go over the top just a little bit to soften it down and lose some of it. Sometimes it ends up being just a touch too white. So we can fix that easily by using the black on top. Okay. Usually the skull, sky hole looks too light any hole that's in the sky, um, in trees or in anywhere else, uh, when it has an area around it, it always looks too light if it's the same colour as the sky. So I'm going to put just a little tiny touch more sky colour in there. And now it will read like the same colour as the sky. It's an optical illusion. We have to make allowances for that. Okay, I'm going to take the tape off and then I'm going to do a few corrections so that we can see what you might need to do on your painting. Right, you can always send me a little text if there's something specific that um, you would like me to you would like me to finish or address. And you have a little time now to catch up and work on these areas that we worked on before. And just a little bit more of that shadow in there. So I'll remind you about what we did. We added dark to the wood down here. I'll add just a bit more dark to that. We added white to the legs. Do a bit more of that and the toes. We added the shadows on the wood. The shadow could be just a bit darker. So we have to go back and change little goodies along the way. A little darker on that shadow. We used a little white paint to give the feathers a feathery look at the back there. 
And you could do that in a few other places too. There's a little tiny feather feel coming around here if you wanted to make that a bit more feathery. Or if you want a few little feathers coming out of the back of the bird. Sometimes that happens. Oftentimes there are little feathers on the back of the neck that are coming out too. To give it more interest, you can do that. Just be a little careful not to overdo the white. Right? In small areas, it works really well. In larger areas, it's not the same color as the paper, so it doesn't work quite as well. So it's best to use it in just small areas. We talked about the idea of putting more color in the background. So I'm just repeating all of the things that we did so that you don't miss out. And if you're not caught up a little bit, then now's the time to catch up with those. Okay, just a little bit of light in here. Just a touch to break up that shadow a bit. A bit more light on the edge there. And now there was a problem that I had with my bird in that the sky has a little, I'm not quite sure why um, I have a little messy area here in the sky. So I'm going to show you how to fix that. Well, it's a little more tricky in a flat sky to fix something like this. Could be because I put my brush back in when it was still wet. But you can see it's right on the top of the bird's beak and it's not the best place to have a problem. So what I'm going to do is take a clean brush and just wet that area up like this. And I'm going to blot it with a tissue and Kleenex and take out some of that darker paint. You take out some of the paint here and just blot it down until you've removed all of the paint and then you can paint in just a little bit more of that color or in a sky you could always turn it into a cloud that's another possibility but even just lifting that amount of paint makes a big difference here so I'm just going to do a little bit more I'm hardly touching the paper but I'm just pulling out, and each time I'm pulling out just the slightest amount of paint, just to lift it up. And that's pretty good. We've done a pretty good fix on that one. So this is the time to fix your painting. Anything that's wrong, you wait until the very end like this, and then you fix it, okay? Really important, really important not to try to fix anything as it's drying because that would just make it worse absolutely make it worse now i'm just going to add a tiny shadow back under here get rid of that white okay all right so if you have any questions you can let me know um, and the eye let me go over the eye again so that you can see how that goes go a little bit closer Okay, so what we did with the eye was we put a little tiny black area in the center and then we went in with our gray tone, the shadow tone, and we put a little shadow tone on the front and the back of the yellow part of the eye. And that's all we need to do for that. And in the center of the beak, it was a brown tone. It could be a blue-gray, it doesn't really matter, but a brown tone I used in there just to separate that out. Now, a pencil line would do that just as well also. So it doesn't have to be paint if, you're, um, if you don't have a brush that's fine enough for that. And just like all of the other subjects that we're painting in this 5 by 7 series of learning how to paint in watercolor, watercolor um, skills, this subject acts as a color study for a larger painting. And on my site, you'll see, uh, if you look for Mora Rock, you'll see a video that shows you how to enlarge proportionally your painting, um, your 5 by 7 to make a larger painting. So this would be a really good one to try a little bit bigger. 
maybe an 8 by 10 or a 9 by 12 approximately. And, um, and you know all the techniques now, so it makes it easier. You've done it once, and so you know exactly where you're going, and you can make it larger. If you do have the opportunity to try 300-pound paper, um, it, unfortunately, it's twice as expensive as the 140-pound. But for certain subjects, like these backgrounds, it makes for a much easier and much more interesting, um, in many ways, surface. So just uh, think about that. You might want to try that. There are three different surfaces, paper surfaces, in watercolor. One is cold press, and that's the standard one that you're using right now. One is hot press, and that's one that I use mostly for ink line because it's very smooth. And then um, the uh, rough paper, there's actually a rough surface too. And each one of these papers comes in either 140 pound or 300 pound. And so you can get a 300 pound rough, you can get 300 pound uh, hot press, and you can get 300 pound cold press. Okay, so it's just twice as thick, and so it stays wet much longer. I often use it for larger paintings because um, it saves a lot of issues um, when you're painting. So I often use that on bigger paintings. So I hope you've enjoyed today. I hope you've learned a lot from this lesson. So let's go back and I'll just say goodbye to you. And thank you for coming. And I hope to see you again in some lessons in the not too distant future. So bye for now.